Well, we're well underway into this uh, first summer series that we've been doing, Don't Let Go of the Ship. And it's been a really fun and exciting series. Amen? Amen? And I really feel that these messages are getting better and better and better. And I am so excited to share this third message with you. And if you haven't heard the last two, then I would go to the website and uh, take a look at those messages and listen to them. And uh, this whole message series was born out of, well, one, my passion and my love for the water. And I love boats. I love surfing. I love the beach. Um, I love being out on the lake. And I saw so many similarities to the Christian life that I wanted to share. And the whole idea of this series, from the, the title of the series, Don't Let Go of the Ship, is uh, basically the idea that we are all on this ship and we're traveling through the oceans of life. And, you know, when the sailing is nice and smooth and the sun is out and everything's going okay, you know, everyone's there, they're at church, everyone's living for the Lord. But when the storms hit, when the difficult seasons come, when the challenges arrive, that's when people tend to let go of the ship. And so there's some ships that we've been looking at that are critical. They're literally critical for us as Christians to hold on to in the storms of life. And so the first week we looked at fellowship. Don't let go of fellowship. In the storms of life, you have to remain in community uh, with others. You need to remain in prayer with others. You need counsel. You need encouragement. Uh, you need that community that has been built for us by Jesus Christ himself. And the Spirit has cemented together and unified the body of Christ to give us stability and to give us strength and to give us encouragement through the storms of life. And so I've, I've watched this over the years in ministry. When the storms hit, one of the things that people let go of first is fellowship. And so the second week, what we were talking about was discipleship. And this is another area that when things are going well, people are, people are doing okay, but then the storm comes and the difficult seasons arise and they start to let go of discipleship in that constant relationship that's being built with Christ and their spiritual growth in the church and in the Word of God and the Christian disciplines. And so they let go of that ship. And I'm telling you, fellowship and discipleship are critical to our survival as Christians and to our growth and to continue to be made strong. And so the one that I want to look at today is don't let go of stewardship. I think this may be, I, I'm so excited to preach this message because I think this may be one of the most important ones right now for the season that the church at large is in because we're just at a time in our, our, the history of the church and we're facing so many challenges and, you know, America is facing challenges and, you know, there's all kinds of economic issues that we're concerned about and the housing market is falling through and people are concerned about their finances and, but, you know, we still have to be faithful to what God has called us to be faithful to. And so when the storms hit, don't let go of stewardship. And I want to explain that and talk to you about that a little bit more. Before we really can practice stewardship, we need to understand what it is and what it means. And so I thought the best way to kind of paint this picture and help us uh, with the context of, of this message and what this word revolves around is just to look at a simple definition of the word stewardship, or steward, or stewarding. Stewardship is a person employed to manage another's property, or whose responsibility it is to take care of something. The position and duties of a steward, a person who acts as the surrogate of another. I like that part of that definition. Especially by managing property, financial affairs, and estate, etc. The responsible overseeing and protection of something considered worth caring for and preserving. The careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. This is what stewardship is. And I was amazed when I started reading through the Bible and I found in the Gospels at least 12 parables where Jesus is speaking about stewardship. It's spoken about through other Areas of the New Testament, and the main text that I want to look at, that I want to kind of launch this message from, is 1 Corinthians 4, 2, where the Apostle Paul tells the church in Corinth, moreover, it is essentially required of stewards that a man should be found faithful, proving himself worthy of trust. I mean, stewardship is not about what you have, but it's about what's been entrusted to you by another. And you know, growing up, I've been telling some stories of 
my sailing experiences because I've literally been sailing dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And when I was 10 years old, my dad and I went and got our charter license so we could charter sailboats. We've rented sailboats up to 40 feet. And we went through this training and, you know, I kind of summed it up to three basic things that they really wanted to, to get through to us. Uh, the training was really extensive. We went through all kinds of chart navigation and we went through how to, how to reef our sails and storm preparation and uh, we had to go through all kinds of teaching classes, and we were out on the water. And, I mean, we had to tie uh, ropes with one hand with our, our eyes blindfolded, I mean, knots. And, I mean, there was all kinds of stuff that, that, that we had to learn in that sailing course. And I kind of summed it up into these three things that I think they were trying to get across to us. I mean, the first thing, they want to go through some pretty extensive training because, first of all, they don't want you to die when you're on the open water because it's dangerous, I mean, you get out there on Lake Superior, and you're 40, 50 miles from shore, and you hit a storm, you've got to know how to prepare your boat for a storm. You've got to know about all the right equipment. You need to know what kind of tools you need to be using out on the boat. So they want to make sure you don't die when you're out there. The other thing they want to make sure that you, uh, you know is, is how to have fun and how to have a good time. But the other thing that I realized, and especially as I was thinking about this message today on stewardship is, when we went through this course, they gave us a booklet that was laminated, and it was a checklist, and it covered everything that you, as the renter, needed to know when you got on that boat. There was a whole checklist of all kinds of different inventory items, different tools, different supplies that were on the boat. Uh, there were pieces of paper that had drawings of the boat, and you had to go around the boat, and you had to uh, inspect the inside, you had to inspect the outside. And so they gave us this little checklist, and the bottom line was this. This company that was renting these boats out, they don't own the boats. There's an owner that owns this hundred or two hundred or $300,000 sailboat, and you're just renting it for a few days, and they don't want you to destroy it. Why? Because it's not your personal property. It belongs to someone else. And so they wanted to make sure that they gave very thorough training in how to use these boats and how to stay safe out on the water, and how to come back safe. And when you came back to port, you had to go all the way back through that checklist, and you had to go through that whole inspection process to make sure that you cared for that boat properly. It's stewardship. It's taking care of something that is in your power, in your control, that you're responsible for, but doesn't belong to you. You're not the owner of it. That's what stewardship is all about. It's about being responsible with what we've give, been given and understanding that we're also answerable to God for the things that we've been given. And stewardship covers a vast area of life. It's not just money, which is a lot of times what we talk about when we're talking about stewardship. It includes money, but it's not just money. It's time. It's family. It's relationships. It's spiritual gifts. It's the talent that we've been given. It's our abilities. And when you take all of that into consideration... And we're talking about stewardship today, and you zoom out and you look at the big picture, what it really means is the influence that we have in other people's lives and what we're doing with what we've been given by God to influence others for Christ. That's huge. And a lot of times we get caught up in the moment by moment issues of life. The storms come, and the first thing that people want to do as the church is they want to let go. They say, I can't take it anymore, I can't do this anymore, I can't keep fellowshipping with people anymore because of all the things that are going on in my life, I can't keep in, in that discipleship uh, that I'm in my relationship with the Lord and can't just keep reading the Bible and can't keep going to that life group and that Bible study and you know what, when it comes to stewardship, times are tough, I'm letting go of the ship. And I'm here to tell you as an experienced sailor, don't let go of the ship, you need to hold on to the ship. And one of the areas that you have to hold on to tightest in the Christian life is stewardship. It's critical. It's absolutely necessary. I want to tell you a story uh, that I recently uh, learned about when I was out in Lake Tahoe in California back in April. I had heard this story about a man by the name of Ki uh, Captain Richard Barter, who was a retired English sailor who had found himself in Lake Tahoe in the 1860s, right around the time of the gold rush. And he was hired by a very wealthy man by the name of Ben Holiday Jr. Now, 
Ben Holiday Jr. would have been on like the Forbes top 100 list here in the United States. He was one of the richest men in the United States. He had moved out west during the time of the gold rush from Missouri, and he owned and operated stagecoach routes all throughout the west. He did extensive work with and uh, uh, business with Wells Fargo. Um, he had also acquired the Pony Express. I mean, he was a very, very wealthy man, very well known out west. And Ben Holiday wanted to build a summer house. So he decided that he was going to build a summer house uh, on Lake Tahoe in one of the most photographed areas of the entire world, Emerald Bay. It's absolutely gorgeous outside of South Lake Tahoe. And so he needed to hire the right person because at this time, Tahoe City was not very well developed. And he was going to build this, this home several miles from town. And because of the harsh winters, it had to be someone that knew their way around the water and could get get across the lake to the town in the winter months because for five months out of the year, the roads were all closed because of the snow. And so for five months out of the year, he needed a caretaker of his property that knew his way on the water so he could get to town throughout those five months. So he hired this retired uh, sea captain from England. And it was a 16-mile journey for him to get from the house to the town. And this man had spent year after year after year Long, harsh winters taking care of this wealthy man's property. And, I mean, he battled with avalanches. He fought off grizzly bears. And just to get to town in the winter months, he had to travel 16 miles. He did this year after year after year, caring for this man's property. And so, on one cold January day in 19, or 1870, he took his little dinghy that he had named Nancy, and he took the 16-mile journey to Tahoe City. He spent the evening there with some friends, eating and drinking, and then he left Tahoe City to take, back, to, to take off back to the house, the holiday house. When he was several miles from shore, a gale force wind came through the canyon and flipped his boat, completely capsized, and he found himself in the icy cold waters of Lake Tahoe in January, the coldest time of the year. Now, this man knew the water, and he knew that if he got separated from his boat, he would die. And he did something that every one of us Christians need to do. He tied himself to the boat so he would not be separated. He was not going to let go of the ship. So he tied himself to the boat. He made it several miles to the holiday house. He did not turn around and go back to the town. He went to the house that he was taking care of, that he was stewarding, that he was managing, that he was responsible for all winter long. And he swam with his boat all the way back to the house, got in the house. I mean, this guy's in his upper 60s, realizes that two of his toes are frostbitten. He carves his toes off with his pocket knife. And he spends the next three months recovering in the house because he was so concerned about caring for this man's property. And he recovered and he spent several more years caring for this man's property. I mean, it was a totally different time. And his name in the community is known as the Hermit of Emerald Bay. And the reason why they called him that is because he spent so much time on that property taking care of it, faithfully serving. You know, I share that story so we have an understanding, just something that we can relate to in our own lives, in the storms of life and the responsibilities that God has given to us. Why are we so quick to abandon ship? I mean, it's critical to our survival that we hold on to what's keeping us afloat in life. We need fellowship, we need discipleship, and we need to, as God's people, understand our responsibilities as stewards. So, in helping us understand this idea of stewardship, there's three things that I, I, I want you to be aware of. I, I want us to have a firm understanding of these three things. First of all is this. You need to know who you belong to. You really deeply, in your heart, need to have a firm understanding of who you really belong to. And then you need to know who owns everything in your life and everything in existence. And then you need to know the third thing is this. What you're responsible for and what your part is. 
Now, I'm not just talking about having all the theologically correct answers, but deep down in your heart, knowing who you really belong to, knowing who owns everything and everything in existence, everything in your life, everything around you, everything in the universe, and then knowing as a steward, because we're talking about stewardship, knowing what am I supposed to do with the part that I'm responsible for. So I ask you, who do you belong to? Not just theologically, but I'm asking you, who in your heart do you know that you really belong to? Because if you want to steward what God has entrusted to you, and to do it appropriately, to do it properly, to do it in a way that glorifies God, to do it in a way that will impact the world around us, then we've got to start with who we really belong to, and knowing that in our heart. The Apostle Paul says, in 1 Corinthians 6.19, do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, whom you have received as a gift from God? These five words will change your life. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, purchased with a preciousness, and paid for, made His own. So then honor God and bring glory to Him in your body. The first thing we have to acknowledge as God's people is, I'm not my own. You know, this is one of the, the, the most deceptive things that enters into our mind. We think there's really three people that have control in our lives. It's either the devil, he has control in our life, or God has control in, in our life. But here's the real, the, the real deceptive one. We think, I have control in my own life. I've thought that before. I've struggled with that myself. I thought, well, either the devil has control in my life or God has control in my life. But you know what? I think probably the safest place for me to be is for me just to have control in my life. You know, the Bible says you're not your own. And the truth is, you have never been your own. I've never been my own. There once was a time that I was a child of wrath. I was under the power and I was under the influence and I was under the control of the enemy and the sin that consumed my life. And you know, we talk about salvation as just being this gift. We're like, yeah, salvation is this gift that God gives us. Yes, it is a gift, but it's so much more than a gift. It's so much more profound. It's so much deeper than that. Salvation is a transference of your life from the ownership of the enemy to the ownership of God. Redemption is the buying back of your life. The buying back of your eternal soul. You and I, we were damned to hell. And rightfully so, because we sin against a perfect and a holy God. And God said, I love you so much. I'm sending my son to die on the cross for your sin. He'll take your punishment. He'll take your wrath. He'll pay the ultimate price. Just trust him as your savior. Let him come into your life. Let him change your life. He's willing. His arms are open. Invite him to come in and to change your life. And the moment that you do that, he takes you from the kingdom of darkness and He translates you into the kingdom of light. The Bible says the Father has delivered and drawn us to Himself out of the control and the dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have our redemption through His blood, which means the forgiveness of our sins. I know who I belong to. I'm not just going to give you the right theological answer. I know in my heart who I belong to. I belong to Him. That's the first step of understanding this whole topic on stewardship. If you don't know who you really belong to, you will not ultimately know what God wants you to do with everything that he's entrusted to you. The second one is this. Who owns everything in my life? Who owns everything in existence? You know, it's kind of, we're, we're silly. We're really silly. I mean, when, you know, when we're kids, we say to our mom, you know, any, anyone who grew up in church here, you know, you say to your mom or your dad, you say, Mom, who made the trees? And mom says, oh, well, God made the trees. The trees belong to God. He's the one who made the trees. And then we say, Mom, who made elephants? Well, God made elephants. God created elephants. Yes, our, our little girl, she loves elephants. And they say, Mommy, who created the fishies in the sea? And we say, well, God created the fishies in the sea. They belong to him. And then you know what? We grow up and we forget that God, he owns everything. And then the question comes, who owns that money in my bank account? Oh, that's mine. 
Whose job is that over there at that law firm? Oh, that's mine. Whose degree is that on the wall? Oh, that belongs to me. Whose talents and abilities are being used at that workplace? Oh, those are mine, the ones that I've acquired. Whose house is that? That's mine. I signed the mortgage on that one. All of a sudden, we start thinking that some things belong to God and other things are really ours and they belong to us without acknowledging that everything in existence belongs to him. In fact, David, at the height of the, the kingdom of Israel, there was no one more powerful, no one more glorious. In the time of King David and King Solomon, and David is about ready to step down as the king, and his son is about ready to take over. And David, he addresses all the people in Israel, and he's also speaking to his son. I mean, I, need, I want you to remember that, I mean, there was no kingdom that was richer than the kingdom under King Solomon. And people from all over the ancient world, they came to Solomon to learn of his wisdom and to behold all of his riches. And I mean, you read the stories about King David, and you can see that he truly is a man after God's heart. And when he's talking to his son, and he's talking to all the people that are there present, this is what he says in 1 Chronicles 29, 10, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven And in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. He wisely acknowledges that everything in his life belongs to God. Everything in the kingdom belongs to God. Everything in heaven and earth belongs to God. Why is it that we're so silly that we'll acknowledge that the trees are made by God? But the house that we live in, the car that we drive, the talents, the abilities, even our time belongs to God. It all is His. None of it is ours. We've just lived in this mentality for so long that we've earned it. We have a right to it. We are entitled to it because we deserve it, because we've worked for it. But it all belongs to God. It's sad that we don't live in that true reality that everything belongs to Him. And the other question I ask you is, what's my part in this then? If I belong to Him as a Christian, and everything in my life belongs to Him, then what's my part? What's my responsibility? This is where we have to get stewardship. We have to understand it. You know, I've, I've been sharing in this series my love and my passion for the water and for boats and for surfing and, uh, you know, for the ocean. And it's always interested me and intrigued me. And I've traveled around the world and visited many different oceans and many different places. And because of my love for some of these water sports, I I read a lot of magazines and watch documentaries. And some of my favorite magazines are Outside Magazine. I love reading Surfer Magazine. And I I, I watch documentaries on these different sports. And, you know, I like some of these brands like you see around like Quicksilver and Patagonia. And, you know, they're not just brands. They're not just clothes. But these were pioneers and these were innovators, are now innovators in the sport. And, you know, the thing that I keep coming across as I read this is this concern that so many of these organizations and so many groups of people that are just regular, everyday human beings, they have this concern for the environment. And the term that I keep seeing, especially within the sailing community, is the term stewardship. And so there's concern that people have about the environment. And I'm not saying that all of their intentions are being uh, put in the right place, but I'll tell you one thing that the world understands that a lot of Christians don't understand, stewardship. The world is teaching us about stewardship. But we as Christians have several passages of Scripture that are given to us in God's Word about stewardship. And so the constant thing that these organizations and these companies and these individuals are coming out and they're saying is this. Do your part to take care of the environment. I'm not against that. But I will say to the church as well, I'll say, do your part to take care 
what God has called us to do as the church. That's what stewardship really comes down to. Understanding and realizing who I belong to, realizing that everything in existence, everything in my life belongs to God. And what's my part? What am I responsible to do? There's this incredible story I want to share with you from Luke chapter 5. If you want to take a look at it, we're not going to read through the whole passage of Scripture. I'm probably going to take a couple of these verses that we'll read here in a moment, but I want to tell you about this story. In Luke chapter 5, this is before Jesus had chosen the disciples. This is before they had gone to follow after him. These were the disciples that would eventually become the apostles. These would be the founding church fathers of the church for the first century. And so this is right on the onset of Christ's ministry, this story here in Luke chapter 5. And so Jesus is standing on the seashore, okay? you got to visualize this, okay? Picture this. Jesus, seashore. you got to love that, right? right? Right down by the water. Great place to be. So Jesus is standing there on the seashore, and he's starting to share the gospel. He's starting to share the kingdom of God with these people, and people are starting to congregate. More people are starting to gather. And Jesus is realizing that it's physically a little more difficult for him to speak, so he's got to reposition himself somehow so he can address all of these people. Well, he's standing on the seashore, and he's backing up against the seashore, and soon he's going to be in the water. More people are gathering around, and he sees these two boats that are over on the shoreline. And so Jesus figures, well, hey, I can jump in one of those boats. I can stand up on the seat, and I can keep preaching the gospel of my Father's kingdom. And so that's what he does. He sees these empty boats, and he steps in one of the boats, and he starts preaching. But more people are gathering around, and a multitude is starting to gather. And he's realizing, I still have to change my position. I've got to somehow get out away from the shoreline in this boat so I can share the gospel with all of these people. And so Jesus is standing in this boat. He doesn't even know whose boat it is. He's just standing in some guy's boat. And then he, says, he sees some, some guys kind of working over on the other side of the shoreline there. And he says, hey, whose boat is this? And then this famous disciple, who is not yet his disciple, he comes over. His name is Simon Peter. And he says, uh, that's my boat. And then Jesus, he says to him, he says, hey, I want you to take me out a little way from the shoreline here. I'm telling these people about the gospel of the kingdom. I'm the Messiah. I'm the son of God. I'm here to tell them the good news about God's love. And uh, Peter's probably standing there like, wait a minute, I got to tell you what's been going on in my life. And so Peter starts to explain. He says, you know, uh, what's your name again? Jesus. Okay, Jesus. I'm a fisherman. And I've been out all night, all day, all night, all day trying to catch fish. And I'm a little frustrated, to be honest with you right now, because I'm trying to catch fish, and there's no fish out there. And then on top of that, my nets broke, and I had to come in, and I had to mend my nets. And now, here you are, standing in my boat. I don't know who you think you are. You're standing in my boat. And you're telling me that you want me to stop doing what I'm supposed to be doing when I have a family to feed, I have money to make, I have a business to run. And you're telling me that you want to use my boat that I use for my business, and you want me to take you out so you can talk to these people about the kingdom? I'm sure, Jesus was standing there like, yeah, that's what I want you to do. And so that's what he does. So Peter gets in the boat, he pushes him out from shore. Takes him out a little ways, and Jesus stands up, and he keeps preaching. And the, congreg- the, the, the people keep congregating. They keep coming. And he keeps preaching. He keeps talking. He keeps sharing about the love of God. He keeps sharing about the kingdom of heaven as these people are gathering around. And then finally, I'm sure, Jesus probably sat down in the boat, and he probably looked at Peter and said, you know, Peter, I, I really want to thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you letting me use your boat. This is the most important thing that my Father has called me to come and do to share this love and to share this truth and to share this gospel with anyone who's willing to hear it. You know, here's the thing. We're all busy in life. We're all concerned about our businesses and we're concerned about the things that we need to do and there's a lot of things that are going on in life and a lot of times in the stressful and the difficult times and the moments of life, we... Let go of stewardship. Before Peter ever became a disciple, Jesus was going to teach him a lesson about stewardship. And he was going to use his boat. You know, the truth is, Jesus shows up in our lives and he's standing in your boat. 
He's standing in your boat. He's standing in the thing that you're most talented with. He's standing in the thing that you have the most ability with. He's standing in your bank account. He's standing in your house. He's standing in your family. He's standing in your time. You want to get saved, and so you ask Jesus to come into your life. And that's what he was doing that day. He was standing in Peter's life. Jesus is in your boat. And so when Jesus says, hey, I want to use this boat, and he says, whose boat is this? How are you going to respond to Jesus? You see, I'm sure Peter was probably thinking in his mind, I'm not sure exactly what he said, but I'm sure he was probably thinking in his mind, like a lot of us would say, well, Jesus, that's my boat. And Jesus was not thinking that that's Peter's boat. Jesus was thinking, this is my father's boat, and he's entrusted it to you. And I want to use it to touch these people's lives. So how are you you going to respond to Jesus when Jesus says, whose boat is this? I'm going to tell you how you want to respond. Jesus, that's your boat. Whose car is this? Jesus, that's your car. Whose bank account is this? Jesus, that's your bank account. Whose abilities and whose talents are these? Jesus, those are yours. Oh, good, because I want to use them to impact multitudes. You see, Jesus shows up in our lives. He wants to use the things that we have. It's interesting because it was in that one moment of time that that boat was critical to what Jesus needed to accomplish. That boat needed to be stewarded. That boat needed to be managed. Something had to be done with that boat. So Jesus finds Peter and says, take me out. So they're sitting out there, right? They're sitting out there in the water. Jesus has already preached. He's probably saying something like, thanks so much, Peter. I really appreciate you letting me use your boat. It's really nice of you. I'm glad you had time to get your nets all fixed up. Uh, Why don't we go out a little bit deeper? And you can cast your nets over the boat. Let's catch some fish. Peter was probably thinking, oh, man, this guy is such a carpenter. You know, I mean, here's Peter. He's a fisherman. And he probably looked at Jesus. He's like, you're a carpenter, right? Yeah, I'm a carpenter. You build tables. Mm Mm-hmm. I build tables. He was probably like, listen, I've been a fisherman for a long time. I know my business, and, uh, you know, I'm glad I could help you out in all Jesus, but I've been out here all day and all night. I'm really frustrated. I'm stressed. And then, you know, you asked me to come out here and help you. I I, I did it. I helped you out, Jesus. Kind of like the attitude that a lot of us have with Jesus. It's like, glad I could, you know, kind of help you out there a little bit, Lord, and kind of, you know, support the ministry a little bit. you know, kind of help what you're trying to do with the kingdom, God. But, you know, I got a lot of other things that are going on in my life. And I'm stressed. This is difficult. This is hard, Jesus. Something really important to the story you got to know right now, and I don't want you to miss this. At this point in the story, Jesus is in control of the boat. It wasn't... Peter's idea to go out there. It was Christ's idea to get out there. And once he got out there, now Jesus is in control of the boat. Jesus is directing the boat. And so Jesus said, Peter, let's go out a little bit deeper. Let's cast down those nets and let's catch some fish. And then Peter responds the way you and I need to respond. He said, okay, at your word, let's go. Because you said so, because you're giving the direction, because you're the one who's leading. You're in my boat, Jesus. But I want you to know that whatever you want me to do with my boat is what's going to be done. You want to go talk to people about the kingdom of God? That's what we're going to do with my boat. If you want to go out and you want to take it a little bit deeper, then that's what we're going to do. We'll cast the nets over and we'll catch fish. But because you said it, that's what we're going to do. You want Jesus in your boat. You want Jesus in your bank account. You want Jesus in your business. You want Jesus in your talents. You want him in your gifts. You want him in your life. You want him part of everything that's going on. But make sure that you acknowledge that he's the owner of it. Well, so the story goes on and they launch out a little bit deeper, throw the nets over, and all of a sudden the fish are jumping in the nets left and right. So much so that the boat's starting to weigh down. The nets are starting to break. And Peter, he yells out to his partners, his business partners on the shore. He's like, get your other boat. Come out here. you got to get out here and help me get these fish. And they come out, and they're just piling fish in left and right. So much so that both of the boats begin to sink. Peter falls apart. He just absolutely falls apart at this point in the story. And the Bible literally says 
in verse number 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I think you realize he was self-centered. He was selfish. He was all frustrated and stressed out over these little things, these little nets that he was mending. Meanwhile, Jesus is standing in the boat saying, I've got something else for you to do. His business partners were so amazed. The Bible says in verse 9, For he, for he and all who were, taken, or, or who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish, which they had taken. And so there was James and there was John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, he said, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch men. Whoa, what a way to get into the ministry. Verse 11, so when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and they followed him. They were convinced. You know, Jesus is in our boats. He's in our lives. He's in all these different areas and these aspects of our life. And I'm asking you today, how are you going to respond when Jesus says, whose boat is this? Whose boat is this? You know, the interesting thing about the story is this. Obedience always comes before the blessing. Always. Oh, we want the blessing, God. We're going to pray for the blessing, God. We're going to fast for the blessing, God. We want the blessing, God. We want the increase, God. This is what we want, God. This is what we're waiting for. And the whole while, Jesus is standing there saying, hey, I'm in your boat. Whose boat is this? Oh, that's my boat. Whose boat is this? (laughs) When will you acknowledge that it doesn't belong to you and it belongs to him? And it's to be used for him. It's to be stewarded for him. He's entrusted it to your care. Just because the storms of life get rough and they get tough doesn't mean that you can abandon ship. It's his boat. How are you going to use his boat to bring him glory? How will you use what God has given you to impact the lives of others? Why do we think it's ours? It wasn't too long ago that my wife and I, we were rushing, we were about ready to leave the house, and just a couple minutes before we left the house and I was grabbing stuff and We were getting the baby bag all ready to go, and we weren't talking or saying anything because we were so focused on getting out of the house, and then I just chuckled. I just started laughing. That's kind of weird when someone just laughs and you haven't said anything to them. So my wife said, why are you laughing? And I told her something I probably should have told her before. It worked out okay. I wouldn't recommend this, but I, I told her, I said, I just added up how much money we gave away this week. Like money we just gave away. A large portion of it was given to Abundant Life, but we gave a lot of money away. It was $432. And we're not the type of people that can give away $432 in a week. And she said, why would you laugh about that? That's what she said to me. And how do you think I responded? God loves a cheerful giver. That's like one of my favorite verses on giving. God loves a hilarious giver. I laughed. And we weren't really in a position where we could give away $432, but you better believe this, that everything that's in my bank account belongs to Jesus. Just belongs to Jesus. However Jesus wants me to give it is how I'm going to give it. And I laugh because it's interesting because God will always ask you to do something that's beyond your current ability. He's not just going to sit there and just play it safe, just play it safe. No, but if you want... To really exercise true faith, you're going to have to take some steps of obedience. And I am a firm believer in knowing that obedience is first, the blessing is second. You've got to be faithful with what God has called you to do. You've got to acknowledge that what's in your life belongs to God. And you've got to ask God, how do you want me to steward it for you? How do you want me to use it for you? It doesn't belong to me, God. It belongs to you. How do you want to use what I have? How do you want to use what I've acquired? How do you want to use my resources? How do you want to use my time? How do you want to use my talent? How do you want to use my relationships? Everything is yours. Use it for your glory, God. You see, because Jesus was concerned about that multitude of people on the seashore, but he's also concerned about the individual. He knew what Peter was going through. He knew the stress that he was under. He knew that... The fish were out of his control, but they're not out of the master's control. And you want your boat. You want Jesus in your boat, and you want to be directed by him. 
and acknowledge that everything in your life belongs to him. God will oftentimes lead us to do things that are beyond our ability. The Bible says, for everyone to whom much is given, of him shall much be required. Are we really prepared for an increase in our lives? And if we are prepared for that increase, then we are also prepared to steward it appropriately. For everyone to whom much is given, of him shall much be required. And of him to whom men entrust much, they will require and demand all the more. If you're in Luke still, there's one passage of scripture I want you to turn to in Luke 16. And I want to read this passage from the Amplified, but you can follow along in your Bible. Luke chapter 16, verse number 10 says, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. Really important concept for us to understand is the church. If you're not faithful with the little that God has given you, then you won't be faithful with more. You just won't be. It never happens. It never will. It's written into God's word. It can't be changed. If you're not faithful with the little things that God has already entrusted to you, you won't be faithful with more. I've seen this through over a decade of ministry. I've listened to people say, uh, uh, that they'll say things like, you know what, I'm, I'm looking for this promotion, and as soon as God gives me this promotion, I'm going to have more money, and more money is going to come into the church. doesn't happen. doesn't happen. I've watched it for over a decade of ministry. But I've seen in the life of my own father, I've seen that this verse has been proven. Because my dad got saved when he was 10 years old, and when he started to hear preaching and teaching on tithing and giving financially to the work of the Lord, My dad at a very young age decided that every single dollar of income that would come into his life, he would automatically give right off the top 10% back to God. My dad told me when he was a little boy, $10 came in a birthday card, a dollar went to church next Sunday, was put in the offering plate. I'm going to tell you something right now, I don't care what you think about this, but heaven stopped for a moment and God saw my dad give that dollar. He saw him give that dollar and he stopped for a moment and said, I can trust him. And God has not stopped blessing my father. My father gives and gives and gives and gives. Since my mother's heart attack, I'm the one who's been put in charge of my my parents' giving. And my parents said, I want to give to abundant life. My parents substantially give to our church. They are invested in our church, and they don't even come to this church. They're just generous. They're just givers. And I've watched it over the years because the Bible says, he who is faithful in a very little thing, you give that $1 out of 10, you better mark that person. That person's going to be blessed. God will increase that person because the Bible says he's also faithful in much. But, on the contrary, he who is dishonest and unjust in a very little thing is dishonest and just also in much. People are always making these big promises. When God blesses me, I will. You better believe that It begins with obedience. You better step out in faith. Stewardship is not about what you will have. It's about what you already have. And if you're not faithful with it, you won't be faithful with more. Verse 11 says, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the case of the unrighteous mammon, deceitful riches, money, or possessions, who will entrust you the true riches? Verse 12 says, and listen carefully, And if you have not proven faithful in that which belongs to another, whether God or man, who will give you that which is your own, that is the true riches. We as the church, we got to get this. We got to be faithful with what's been entrusted to us as God's people. No servant is able to serve two masters, Jesus says, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stand by and be devoted to the one and despise the other. Jesus very boldly says, you cannot serve God and money. Riches are anything in which you trust and on which you rely. You know, this is what it all really comes down to. This is the bottom line right here. Is the reason we don't want to acknowledge that these things belong to God is because we depend upon them more than we depend upon Him. That's the truth. It's the truth. We depend upon our relationships more than God. We depend upon our time more than God. We depend upon our 
accomplishments more than God. We depend upon our talents and our abilities more than we depend upon God. But when a man or a woman finally comes before God and says, God, I belong to you. Everything in my life, everything in existence belongs to you. Now use it for your honor and for your glory and not my own. I completely trust and I completely depend upon you. Man, Jesus is in the boat and Jesus is giving directions. And I'm telling you, it's a great journey when Jesus is the one who's directing you in your life and you're using everything he's entrusted to you for his purposes and for his glory. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and he delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, uh, one, and each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Jesus uses a parable that we're probably all pretty familiar with. And it's a parable about stewardship. If you remember in this story that the one man who had five talents, he had doubled those talents and made ten. The man who had two doubled them and made four. But remember what happened with the one man who just had that one little talent? He buried it. He hid it away. It didn't affect anyone. And it's interesting too because as Jesus likens the kingdom to this Lord, this landowner who has these servants, he says that he entrusted these talents according to their ability. Some people look at the guy who has the five and says, I only got one. It doesn't matter if you got one. That's not the point. The point is, that's all you can handle. So use it. And use it wisely. You see, we read this passage of scriptures of the church, and this is really being likened to the church. It's being likened to the disciples. It's being likened to the servants of Christ. And we get so excited about this passage because we've been entrusted something. And then the Bible says immediately he went on a journey, and the church is like, yeah, party! We've been entrusted with all this cool stuff and we get to do whatever we want to do with it whenever we want to do it and we're just going to have fun and we're just going to, you know, chill out and hang out and everything's going to be real cool and, you know, we don't have any responsibility and we can just kind of go with the flow and we can just kind of do what we want and we can just kind of do it when we want it and there's no responsibility. Then the voice comes from the wilderness. And the pastor has to come and remind the church of verse number 19, which says, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Oh, I guess we do have some responsibilities that we need to take care of before he returns. Everyone wants to shut up the voice. The pastor starts preaching. The evangelist starts preaching. The accountability starts coming into play and out of care and concern, out of love for God, for the word, for Christ, for the church. The constant challenge that I have as a pastor is helping people understand their need for being a wise and a good steward of what God has entrusted to them. And the responsibilities that we have as the church. And you know what? I wish it wasn't so long because it's decade after decade after decade and people think they have time but the bible says to redeem the time for the days are evil we think we have time we think we can squander it we think we can waste it we can think we think that we don't have to be responsible with it we think we can just chill out and hang out and everything's gonna you know there's other people in the church that are doing things i'm going to tell you something churches are not built by the gifts and the talents of a few they're built for the sacrifices of many. And so, so many servants just sit back and they're like, I don't have to be responsible for anything. I'm going to use everything that I have in my life for my life. Meanwhile, Jesus is standing in the boat. Whose boat is this? Is it really yours? How long are you going to sit there and think that? Because after a long period of time, the Bible says that the Lord of those servants came and he settled accounts with them. You know, early on in ministry, a lot of things surprised me. 
they don't surprise me anymore because I've heard it all now. After over a decade of ministry, I've heard every excuse. I've heard every reason. I mean, I've sat, I've talked with people for hours and hours on end. I've sat there, I've prayed with people. I've heard it all before. And so people, they always say when it comes to any of these areas that we're covering in this series, don't let go of the ship, don't let go of the ship, don't let go of the ship. I'm sharing my personal experiences with you. I'm sharing the word of God with you. I'm saying you can't let go of fellowship. You can't let go of discipleship. And I hear it all. People say, well, you don't understand what my family's going through right now. You don't understand what my financial situation is. And you don't understand my Roth IRA isn't making the money that it used to make. And you don't understand the emotional things that I'm going through. And you don't understand the offenses that I've had to endure from other Christians and other leaders. And you just don't understand. Well, I'll tell you one thing I do know. The winds are blowing, the waves are rising, and you're in the midst of a storm. My best advice for you is don't let go of the ship. Taking you back to that story once again, you need to tie yourself to the boat if you plan on surviving. And what do so many people do? They just abandon ship and they totally forget. I wish it wasn't so long because people forget he's coming back. And you and I have to stand before him. No one else is going to be standing there with you and guess what? No excuses will do. You can use the excuses with me. I've heard them all before. But when you stand before him, no excuses will do. What are you doing with your life to bring him honor and glory? Moreover, it is essentially required. This is not optional. This isn't take it or leave it. You can't ignore it. You can't walk away from it. It's essentially required of stewards that a man should be found faithful, proving himself worthy of trust. We hope you enjoyed this message from Risen Life. To find more, go to risenlife.net.